good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm David Smith, master of the Worship Company of Cooks, and it's my privilege this evening to welcome you to this seminar on the impact of food on the climate. Now, this is an important subject uh, and a massive one at that. So it's actually being broken down into three slightly more digestible chunks, food waste, the food supply chain, and how we can reduce emissions and aid biodiversity. All of which, of course, are actually PhD subjects in their own right. But our speakers are exceptionally well versed in their own subjects. There are, of course, big questions to be answered, none of which have easy answers. But we do need to focus on what is actually achievable in a realistic timescale and those which are economically viable. You'll have seen our presenters' biographies in the various documentation that's come out ahead of the seminar, so I don't need to introduce them individually. But I would like to start by congratulating Alison on, uh, first of all, uh, setting up this seminar this evening and for getting so many people involved. I think there are about 140 or 150 on the screen at the moment. But I'd also like to congratulate her on her recent election as one of the sheriffs for the city for the forthcoming year. Alison is well known as a committed advocate of climate action, and she's been championing sustainability in the city for a long time before it was fashionable to do so. Her commitment and energy is formidable, uh, and she hasn't been called a pocket dynamo for nothing. Now, before we move on to the actual presentations, I must just mention that I personally have a, a little difficulty with the expression food waste because to my mind, food only becomes true waste when there's no other useful purpose that it can be put to. And a lot of the time we actually talk about surplus food. And I would like to think of that as being food that can be repurposed. My, my point here being that to bring it back to the livery and the city, there's actually a bottom line incentive to most businesses and particularly cooks, chefs, caterers, to reduce and minimize their waste. Now, following discussions at the City Food Lecture early this year, my own livery company, The Cooks, has actually initiated a project to see how different sources within the city, for example, in livery halls, can actually be better linked to those areas of need, especially in the city fringe. The aim of the project is to get surplus food that can be repurposed and channel it into where it's needed. Logistics, of course, will be the key to this, uh, especially to ensure that the cold chain and traceability are maintained. We're going to hear some good real life examples from both Laura and Julianne later on. And I'm particularly interested to hear about the food that can come from Spitalfields Market that a few years ago would have gone to be wasted, but is now being repurposed by City Harvest. And I know that Richard Whitlock, as master farmer, has some pretty trenchant views on pr production and the supply chain. Now, despite all the talk these days about rewilding the countryside and farmers being responsible for improving the environment, we shouldn't forget that farmers' principal purpose in life is actually to grow food for our increasing population. And there are, of course, legitimate debates to be had about how, if they are to rewild and increase forestry, how are we going to achieve any form of food security in some of the staple goods that we actually can produce in this country uh, rather than importing them? And then, of course, there's the debate about whether we should be reducing meat consumption by 20%. So let me now turn over to Alison Gauman, who wants to say a few words of introduction herself. Yes, thank you very, very much indeed, um, David, Master Cook. It's great to have you at the top of the bill here and obviously setting out very clearly some of the very great issues and there are no absolute answers, but we want to explore some of the questions that you, the livery members and livery companies will have around this topic. Um, just let me just say a brief word of introduction about the Livery Climate Action Group. This arose out of the first seminar that we held in January. This is now the third of these seminars. 
And we're a group of livery members who have got together to see that we need to respond to the City Corporation's climate action strategy. That strategy is both uh, a challenge to the corporation in its own right and its own work, but also a challenge to all of those who work and live and do business in the city, in the square mile, and the livery companies are right there, bang square, right in the middle of the square mile. So we need to look at what we're doing. And this is, um, the idea is that the group will provide some guidance to livery companies as and when they need it. And these seminars are just one way in which we can all upskill our understanding of these difficult topics, uh, become familiar with some of the jargon that's thrown out and isn't always very clear. And that's why it's so great that the livery have these experts on hand. So you don't want to hear much more from me. I'm going to hand over to our three presenters. As David said, you have had their bios, but they are the master farmer, second master for tonight, which is great. Richard Whitlock, who's going to start. Moving on to Juliana Coyote Noble, who's managing director of the Sustainable Restaurant Association. And then uh, Laura Winningham, who is the founder of City Harvest, the charity. So Richard, can I pass to you? Thank you very much indeed um, for your attention and your involvement. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Alison. My background is the agricultural merchanting industry, trading between farmers, the first producer, and the primary processor industry, both in the UK and overseas. So I am focusing on the farmer's role in the supply chain. Um, farmer's primary aim, as the master cook said, is to produce food and uh, to main economic viability to his business. He's got to make money like everybody else, but he loves the environment that he lives in. Very often that's a challenge, of course, both with the weather and also trying to maintain the natural environment of biodiversity. He has a requirement to optimize cost and outputs, always seeking the highest price um, for his sales, but also though looking to source goods at the lowest cost. And then he has an obligation to fulfill his contractual um, needs to the supply chain and comply with the law. And uh, of course, there is a lifestyle to farming as well. And let's not forget that because I think a lot of farmers um, put that ahead of some of their financial ambitions, which is slightly challenging at times, but it does at least mean that we do have farmers who are passionate about their industry. If we look at the food supply chain, where are we going then in terms of how long stuff lasts, food lasts in the supply chain? These sorts of products here, lettuce, raspberry and strawberries, if you keep them in your shelf or in your fridge for more than a few days, they will start to deteriorate a little longer for some of the other vegetables, cabbages, beans and uh, leeks there. And some of the root vegetables and even marrows, if you keep them in a cool larder, they will last up to a month. And then moving on to these other ones, uh, potatoes, potatoes that are not washed or carrots that are not washed can stay in store over winter. As soon as you wash them, they start to deteriorate. There's wheat at the bottom and just off, off shot there is some oilseed rape, some apples and some uh, onions, all with good storage conditions can last for a year for season to season food availability. But of course, all processing produces byproducts. If you take those carrots in the top left hand corner, they're fanged, they're ugly, uh, but we want the perfect carrots, the ones that are next to them washed beautiful shape. And that isn't a desire by the supermarket or any of the retailers. That is the shopper sorting out what they want. Retailers only supply what the market is prepared to pay for. So there is a differentiate, differentiation there on shopper choice. But this picture in the bottom left-hand corner, they're the sort of choppings and waste from a food processing plant that do have, as David Smith said, a, a, a new role and they are repurposed. Likewise with these potato peelings. If we go up to the top here, wheat even we'd think all of that could be used for human consumption. Yes, in the main it could be, but we don't always want to eat wholemeal uh, flour. And so when we have white flour, we end up with bran and germ and the byproduct, the surplus of those availability of products goes to animal feed. Here's a nice handsome Hereford cow in the bottom left hand corner. Unfortunately, only about 50% of him 
is available for consumption by various markets. Uh, we've got heads and uh, uh, hooves, we've got intestines, we've got lungs, we've got bones and all of those sort of things. And on a regular basis, they get reprocessed into other sectors of the market. Some of it, ladies, I, I will just tell you, goes into the um, beauty market. So uh, that cow does have many available products, including, of course, the skin on his back to make our leather shoes, et cetera. Um, so all of those products have an economic solution, and it is an economic rationale that drives the market. Lower valued products or downgraded product are not just thrown away into landfill. As long as they are regularly available and there is an economic reason, then the market will take those up. The challenges are in the market, of course, lead time from planting to harvest. So say like lettuce and uh, strawberries, the farmer plants the lettuces eight to 12 weeks before he thinks there's gonna be a sunny barbecue weekend and it rains all weekend, there's a surplus of lettuce. There's a hot weather spell, the lettuces come onto the market a week earlier than they should do. Those are challenges and that does create a degree of uh, unusable product at the point of consumption. Likewise, birth to maturity of livestock. Some livestock mature slightly slower than people anticipated. Weather, disease, consumer trends, all of these things are challenges in the market. I have put a few things there. People don't go shopping to buy cow's heads or wonky vegetables, so we have to find alternative outlets. Just to let you know, we have got a new market to China where we send pig's heads and trotters, and we also send chicken heads and chicken feet. So uh, there are opportunities around the world for different byproducts. Just to put life into perspective though, to have an efficient supply chain where product is always available and we don't have shortages, there has to be surpluses. You can't rely on the consumer or the market to supply just enough all of the time. Otherwise, if there's a surge, maybe due to a barbecue weekend, everybody wants to buy salads, there wouldn't be enough. So the, the retail supply chain does always supply surpluses. But RAP, one of the investigative bodies that looks at um, food waste in the supply chain, estimate that 10 million tonnes of food is wasted every year in the UK. But horrifically, 7 million tonnes of that is in the home. And if we look at these fast deteriorating vegetables, 5% of fruit and vegetables are wasted on farms, and 40% of that 5% is due to substandard deliveries. So your fanged carrots, your wonky vegetables are then wasted, have to find an alternative outlet because they can't go for retail consumption. Likewise, these uh, products, 9% of strawberries, 19% of lettuce end up of, as waste. We don't tend to use lettuces uh, for a soup or anything like that as a repurposing. We are part of our own problem, of course. Ever cheaper food, poor diet, excess calorie intake, and an ever-growing population. And really, perhaps we should do something about those basics in the supply chain. Here are some solutions. Uh, improve demand forecasting, market accept lower standards, buy more of those wonky vegetables, alternative uses, um, use some of them for canning, slicing and liquidizing. Animal feed is not a wrong product. Anaerobic digestion, there is a big subsidy available to put product into that market. So farmers are very keen to put byproducts into those markets because they get paid for it. And as a last resort, very last resort, it might be that it's plowed back into the soil, but that uh, at least does add some fertilizer and nutrition back. One of the ambitions we should be looking for is to eat local and seasonal food, uh, use greater taxes and subsidies. Some, sometimes you have unforeseen circumstances. I mentioned anaerobic digestion, renewable fuels are another one that are causing distortions in the supply chain. And I'm not sure all of this ambition, creating one incentive uh, isn't distorting other ordinary markets. Giving food away is a good charitable ambition, as long as it doesn't e increase the cost 
or undermine existing markets. Bear in mind that if you give food away, people will queue up for the free food and that undermines the mainstream food chain. So the mainstream food chain has perhaps then got to pay more. And we have to be careful about distorting markets. Farmers much prefer, they're not mean or anything like that, they much prefer voluntary altruism. And I've just put up there some of the examples of the things that farmers do in the supply chain voluntarily. You will see up there City Harvest, uh, our last Lord Mayor show parade, um, gave all of the food from our um, trailer to City Harvest. We do FaceTime, we open farms for Open Farm Sunday. There is in the bottom left hand picture, this one here, send a ton to Africa. And here is a farmer here giving away vegetables to uh, various players in need. If we then go on to the challenge of what um, farming has, but just by being a farmer cropping land, we do create greenhouse gas emissions. It's estimated that UK farmers produce 45 and a half million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So don't assume everything is CO2. We produce some other gas as well. And the NFU has got an extremely ambitious aim, the National Farmers Union, to be net zero by 2040. That's a full 10 years ahead of the British government. And well done for them for challenging that. Here is where agriculture sits in the pecking order of the big emitters. You can see 10%. And so we are not an insignificant player and we have to do something about delivering good outcomes. Uh, and this is one of the main challenges. If I just look at the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from a crop of wheat, you will see the two big red and uh, dark red blocks. That is nitrogen fertilizer manufacture and nitrogen fertilizer emissions from the soil once you've applied it. So we have got to do something about uh, alternative nitrogen uh, sourcing, whether it be uh, using GMs to produce um, a leguminous um, crop of wheat that uh, creates its own nitrogen or using manures or something. So that's one of the challenges for the arable farming sector. Here's a challenge for the livestock sector. That huge red is greenhouse gases from UK dairy and beef animals. And you can see therefore, that that is a big problem. So the red meat, particularly the beef sector where they're and the dairy sector is a huge challenge. You can see, despite the fact that we have chickens and pigs and a lot of chicken is consumed in this country, they are much lower in greenhouse gas emissions. Cows have a problem in as much that they're ruminants and therefore they burp and there's wind comes out the back end as well. And also, um, the big heaps of poo that they create, there are gases come off of those. And if I just show you here, the carbon dioxide, um, if you, uh, I'm just gonna go some, oh, that's, uh, go if I can, I'm gonna try and move my screen across so that I can read it. But um, if I can say carbon dioxide is a multiplication factor in greenhouse gas, uh, global warming potential of one, Methane is 23, nitrogen, nitrous oxide from nitrogen fertilizer is 290. And then those awful things that we talked about several years ago, CFCs, PFCs, those refrigerants and, uh, and aerosols, they are somewhere between 12 and 20,000 times on global warming potential. So you can see methane and nitrous oxide are problem child and we in farming have our challenges that we've got to overcome. Alison, that's a very quick run through. Yes, I realise. And hand you. over to you now. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to go straight to the Sustainable Restaurant Association. So just as a um, hello and a thank you to Alison for inviting me this evening. I'm Julian Calluet noble I'm the Managing Director of an organisation called the Sustainable Restaurant Association. And I want to kind of build on what Richard was talking about with the start of the supply chain and the role of the farmer and ahead of Laura speaking, talk about that middle bit of the consumer and the diner um, and the choices that we make every day in terms of feeding ourselves. So hopefully I want to inspire you guys to think a bit differently about your food choices and opt for food that doesn't cost the earth. Um, 
I'm going to, as as kind of mentioned in that that ending by Richard, we uh, this is a big topic that we could spend hours talking about, and I'm going to focus our attentions on three key issues this evening. So the first is our penchant for eating animal products, and um, 330 million tons of meat and 812 million tons of dairy are produced globally each year which accounts for 60 percent of farming's ghg emissions uh, and 16.5 percent of total global emissions so by far the largest impact that we could have on uh our on our emissions is by changing our diet if just the two billion top meat eaters in the world, so if you looked at the quote unquote developed world and uh, the Western world and our meat habits, if the two billion top eat meat eaters cut our consumption by just 40%, it would free up land the size of India. One third of all Britons have reported already cutting the meat that they are eating or moving towards a more vegan diet. I want to focus our conversation today on the fact that we need billions of people to reduce our consumption. We don't need thousands of people to go vegan. So this is not a call to action asking anybody here to become a vegan, but instead it's about us thinking more creatively about how we move away from the idea that meat, particularly beef, needs to be at the center of a plate and how we shift our thinking on that. This second main issue that I think we should focus on this evening is around plastic and uh, pollution. Just 10 pr products make up 75% of all plastic pollution. Uh, of that, six of those 10 are related to food service. So WWF predicts that by 2030, the volume of plastic in the ocean will outweigh marine life. And as we know, um, as is increasingly in the news and especially in a post David Attenborough call to action world, um, we the, the things that we think are getting recycled are not getting recycled. Um, we have an increasing problem around the waste management side of our uh, supply chain. It is uh, essential that we stop thinking that compostable or bioplastics are the realistic solution to um, our single waste problem. And we start thinking about circular solutions, particularly when it comes to food service. There are some very exciting things happening in terms of uh, reusable cup trials, in terms of consumer goods trials on, um, on kind of products to home delivery that are in reusable and returnable containers. More, we need to be thinking about solutions for, um, for circular as opposed to other single use solutions. And then finally, food waste. So Laura is going to really touch on this more in her conversation, but as was alluded to before, 1 million tons of food is wasted across the food sector. Uh, that's equivalent to one in six of eight billion meals served annually. Uh, there's enough food wasted to fill the shard more than 10 times and 75% of this waste is avoidable. It costs restaurants and food service 2.5 billion pounds a year at almost 200, uh, sorry, at almost 20,000 pounds per site in terms of food that is fit for human consumption that's being wasted. Uh, Laura will absolutely pick up on this, but the things I want to say, it, just tying into what Richard mentioned at the end, we need to be thinking about the waste hierarchy more than anything, which means we should be prefer preferencing food for human consumption before it moves down the supply chain. And we need to be thinking about our role in that. So of course, redistribution is important. Of course, it um, is helpful with, that any food surplus that you find, delivery company dinners, or when you're out and about is handed to another um, person that could consume those products. But that's not going to solve our problem. The problem is we have an overconsumption, you know, an overactive supply chain from start to finish, driven by consumer demands. And so the more that we think and rethink about what abundance needs to look like, about what we expect from any one menu, any one dish at any time, 
the more that we can start to shift the dial because we should be preventing waste before it happens as opposed to redistributing it at the end. So who are we? Uh, we are the sustain I'm the sustainable rest work for the Sustainable Restaurant Association. We were founded in 2010 with 50 founding members of UK food service businesses that were interested in this idea of how do we measure and drive sustainability across the food service sector. We are now the world's largest food service sustainability program. We've got networks here in the UK, to Tokyo, Hong Kong, and we manage about 12,000 uh, commercial kitchens and, and sustainability across those brands. We, we are at that intersection of the sustainable food movement and the food service industry. As I mentioned before, we're not a campaigning organization. We're not trying to tell you that we all need to be vegan. What we do believe is that if everybody looks at um, the sustainability across their operation, we together can make a huge difference in the impact of our sector. So how can you make a difference? I've got five actions uh, that I want you all to take away and think about, particularly when it comes to your engagement as livery companies and the work, that, the uh, events that you guys host and the work that you do. But ideally, if this extends beyond that and into the all aspects of your life, um, we can really make a difference. So the first most important action is to fight for local and seasonal menus. If we really do want to change the emissions um, in our supply chain, we should be sourcing a variety of ingredients. The more that we can fight for those seasonal uh, vegetables, seasonal fruits, things that are coming from your local farms, the better and the, the more that we won't be importing the same two species of, uh, of apples or the, the same one species of carrot and lead to a, a more diverse supply chain. This also would fight for British farmers and uh, encourage farmers towards a supply chain that values those ingredients and doesn't encourage sending them to biodiesel or things instead. So wherever possible, really looking and encouraging, preferencing those local and seasonal menus. Now, consider where to cut back on your meat and your dairy and make it special. Again, there's a lot to be said for the uh, dairy, the, the beef and dairy um, farm, farmers in this country. We have some of the highest welfare standards in the world. Um, again, a reason to champion those standards and not let those be taken over by some of these trade deals. Um, but, looking, re-looking at how we think of our plate and cut back on that meat and dairy. Um, think about meat as a treat, as a piece, and also think about what Richard was pointing to about those pieces of the cow that aren't being used. And think if we can shift away from the sirloin or uh, the tenderloin and towards a different cut of meat or a different preparation that requires less of it. Rethink what abundance looks like. So again, as I was talking about food waste and the waste hierarchy, it's absolutely essential that we prevent waste before it happens as opposed to just redistributing at the end. So that means rethinking our images, particularly of large sector events or things away from buffets that need to be full all the time. And, uh, you know, plates that need garnishes and things that don't get eaten or drinks with large pieces of fruit hanging off the side. We need to rethink what that abundance looks like and instead be celebrating how we can be using all aspects of our fruit and our vegetables in our meals as uh, something that we're proud of, as opposed to being proud of the fact that there is loads on the table which will never get eaten. We need to understand our waste streams and use appropriate materials for those waste streams. So as I was mentioning around plastics not being recycled, it's really important to realize that a lot of these pushes towards compostable products in place of plastic is leading to an even, uh, a, you know, an even more empty place. We don't have the infrastructure in a lot of instances for that commercial composting. So it's really essential that before requiring, you know, shifting, shifting our choices to those products, we understand where they would actually end up because if they're just ending up in landfill, then you could be contributing to a larger problem. So um, 
opt for circular or multiple use instead of single use where possible. Rethink how uh, does that need to be served with with you know its own set of um, single use cutlery or does it need a straw or a stirrer and look at how you can reduce the amount of single use waste that you're you're creating. And finally, vote with your fork. If you put your pounds towards those sustainable choices when di dining out, you're reconfirming for restaurants and for food service businesses that these choices are worthwhile and that making an effort to ensure that you are using all products or that you are being creative with your uh, meat-free dishes is worthwhile efforts from the chefs. The other aspect of that is, as Richard was saying, it's not the supermarkets that are dictating that we need, it's consumer trends that are dictating what we have in our market and what sells. And so the more that you opt to show your restaurant that you will choose a more sustainable option, that you will actively promote or visit or choose that caterer for your event because of the choices that they're making, the more that those choices have market value and ricochet across the industry. And over to Laura Winningham from City Harvest. So in London each month, um, we've done a bit of research and we've learned that there's enough food wasted, edible food, um, to more than meet the needs of the people who need food. So 10.2 million meals are needed and 13.3 million meals are wasted by businesses for any number of reasons. And I think we covered a lot of them tonight. Um, City Harvest exists to divert all nutritious edible surplus food to people in need. We're, we're a registered charity. We currently deliver to over 350 organizations that feed the hungry. And each day we deliver around 20 tons of food in a fleet of 16 refrigerated vans. Our specialty is fresh, perishable food, really healthy food. It's different than the type of food you'd get at a food bank. Our work really creates value from waste. And to date, we've rescued 8,500 tons of food, prevented 33,000 tons of greenhouse gases and um, delivered 21 million meals to people in need. Our work meets nine of the UN sustainability development goals, including zero hunger, sustainable cities, and several others. City Harvest is unique in that many of the people on our team come from backgrounds where they've experienced either homelessness or hunger. So our team tends to be really passionate about what we do. I think it's one of the reasons we were able to stay open every single day since the pandemic began. Um, these people knew they were delivering food to places that helped them in the past. Um, so it really fueled the fire. We get food from every type of business, from supermarkets to farms, film studios, restaurants, and we deliver to every type of community organization, um, not, not just soup kitchens and homeless shelters, but any organization using surplus food for the greater good. So it could be um, an after school program for children doing sports, but the people running it realize the kids are gonna go home and not eat dinner. So they ask City Harvest for food. It could be um, a probation officer in Wandsworth who feels that our food would make people um, sit around and talk and stay on straight and narrow better. Um, so our food's used really creatively. We redistribute any type of food. I think the only thing that we don't accept is sushi, but absolutely everything else. And some of our um, donors include um, Amazon, Charlie Bigums, Nando's, uh, New Spitalfields Market, um, several, and New, uh, New Covent Garden Market. And I think people um, come to City Harvest, businesses work with us because we have a paid team of drivers. We're very reliable and responsive. Every food donor has slightly different needs. So we work on really bespoke solutions to get surplus food to where it's needed most. But right now there's greater urgency for our food than ever. We've, we've grown really quickly, even before the pandemic. Um, in the year before the pandemic, we delivered 4 million meals, but in the year ended March 2021, we delivered almost 10 million meals. That was in direct response to the 
growing need in London and the importance of our work. Um, a lot of this has been covered tonight, but 8.4 million people in the UK are struggling to afford to eat and 28% of the population in London lives in poverty. That's, those are pre-pandemic numbers. I'm most certain that percentage has gone up. 67% of children in some areas in London live in poverty. So uh, right now we deliver to around 300 charities. We have th uh, 350, we have around 300 on our wait list, charities that would like City Harvest food. Delivery companies have really been very important to City Harvest this year. Um, we've had generous support from many of them. Um, and we've been part of the Livery Kitchen Initiative, which really has shown how livery companies can collaborate and really get the job done. We've delivered uh, almost, I think, 170,000 meals to charities across East London, really excellent meals made in the kitchen of the drapers, fishmongers, and grocers. And these have been extremely well um, appreciated in the community. That's coming to an end in July, but it's made a huge difference during this pandemic period. Um, the City of London has very generously, generously let us use space at New Spitalfields Market, where the traders give us around, on average, two tons of food um, each time we collect from them. So on a daily basis, we'll often collect two tons of food, sort it, and get it out into the community. Many of the charities that we go to are either vegetarian or halal. So the surplus at New Spitalfields Market is really key, um, healthy food, and um, it, it's, been, it's been a great collaboration. As we said before, food isn't waste until it's wasted. It gets wasted for any number of reasons, but City Harvest is there to collect it. We follow the food waste. We encourage everyone to follow the food waste hierarchy. Um, prevent, but if there is any unused food, it should go to people before any other um, method of waste, especially with so many in need in the community. Um, why should livery companies get involved in donating food to people in need? It really, um, what we found, especially with um, the, the teams involved in the Livery Kitchen Initiative and many of our food don donor partners is it really builds morale. It gets, it wakes everyone up to the fact that in the community, right around where businesses are operating, there's need and connects people to the community. And we just think it makes businesses and organizations stronger. Uh, in, in terms of donating, a lot of people think there are reasons why not to donate, but quite honestly, it's very easy. We collect most everything. Um, there aren't that many extra steps needed. Um, some people think we can't collect chilled food, but we have a fleet of refrigerated bands. We could select, collect refrigerated or frozen food. We could take any volumes and um, we, we just need food to be, um, for instance, if it's coming from a caterer, we just need the dates, the allergen information. It needs to be kept in the chill chain. Food shouldn't be open and we can't take food from a buffet. But if there is an event and there's food left over and it's still in the chill chain, City Harvest can collect it. Just to conclude, the decisions that everyone is making, everyone on this call that has a say in their surplus food, the decisions really will have an enormous impact on society and the planet. So what we suggest at City Harvest is that businesses operate in a socially responsible way. It's really good to measure and factor in the cost of food waste on the environment really think about what it is that that's going on in your kitchens. Make sure all unused edible food gets to people. Um, another thing we see is that um, in businesses, sometimes someone, a junior person says, oh, I, I see a lot of waste, what, we can, what can we do with it? And they're not all, sometimes they're just not empowered by senior people to make a change or find a solution. So we like to say that, you know, please let everyone that's, in your kitchen have a say, be able to share what they see as waste and what could be done and try and act on it. And food donation should be integrated into everyday normal business. It shouldn't sort of sit aside it. Um, as an example, Nando's we collect from around 50 restaurants. Um, 
we're really, um, we make it so easy. They take unsold chicken, they put it in a special plastic bag, they put it in their freezer. City Harvest comes in, walks to the freezer, doesn't interrupt any of the day-to-day -day business. We wave to the staff and then we exit. And then people in the community are eating that chicken by the evening. Um, it's simple. Uh, the people at Nando's feel good about it. So I, I just that's just an example to point out how simple it really can be. Um, when you're working with suppliers, if you could ask them what they're doing with their surplus, and if you know, if you could encourage them that if they have surplus food, it should be donated, that really helps. Um, we're having conversations like that, um, you know, it, with many businesses, because a lot of retailers are being observed about their surplus food, but farther up the supply chain, um, it, it, people aren't looking too closely. So the more people are asking questions about it, it raises awareness and we think people will take action. Um, lastly, if anyone wants to come down to the City Harvest Depot, um, either in West London or at New Spitalfields, happy to show you around. Uh, there's volunteer opportunities and there's opportunities to sponsor our vans and show that uh, you're supporting the community. Thank Great. you. My thank again, Dave Smith at the top of the programme, Master Cook. Fantastic to have your views and the Cook's involvement on this. Then again, the Master Farmer, Richard Whitlock, thank you. I know the farmers have got um, a lot to say on this topic and it was good to have you then here. And then our two contributors, um, not directly from the livery, but very involved with it, uh, Julianne Kayach Noble from the Sustainable Restaurant Association and Laura Winningham from City Harvest, all um, excellent presentations. Mm -hmm.